is a study on facial fat grafting during ritidectomy by Dr. Sino, Stusen, and Associates. It's an online survey of 2,200 ASPS members with a response rate of 14%, which is above average. The goals were to determine how commonly fat grafting is done with facelifts, to look at the methods used, and to determine the locations and amounts injected. 85% surveyed perform fat grafts with their facelifts and nearly half do it in half of their cases. The abdomen is the most popular donor site. The fat is prepared and injected by conventional techniques. Half used up to 25 cc's total fat and another third used up to 45 cc's. The sites most commonly injected were the nasolabial folds, the pregial sulcus, the malar area, tear trough, lid cheek junction, and the temples. The highest volumes were placed in the deep malar area. The most challenging areas were the tear trough, lid cheek junction, and upper lid sulcus. Contour deformities were the most common problem, and over half believe that skin quality gets better with fat grafts. The procedure adds 15 to 45 minutes. Half of the surgeons believe that 50 to 75% remains at six months, and one third believe the same amount remains at two years. Patient and, sur and surgeon satisfaction was high, but this of course is largely subjective. The discussion is a must read. It's an eloquent discourse on facial aging and the synergy between facial fat repositioning and fat grafting. The authors make the following points. SMAS procedures reposition fat to reestablish the volumetric highlights of youth. It also moves fat inward to treat radial expansion, thereby improving mandibular contour and submalar concavity. Fat grafting complements SMAS procedures. It reinflates areas where SMAS procedures have no effect, such as the perioral area and the temples. It softens boundaries between aesthetic units, such as the lid cheek junction and the pregial sulcus. This study raises some questions for further investigation. First, are there areas in the face where fat graft take is optimal and therefore more effective? If so, should some areas be overcorrected more than others to compensate for the anticipated differential rates of resorption? Also, are the temples, glabella, and periorbital area too high a risk for catastrophic visual loss and therefore should be avoided? Are areas prone to aesthetic morbidity, like the tear trough and upper eyelid, worth the risk for the occasional impressive result? Can technique be improved to improve fat graft survival? For example, some have shown impressive long-term results using more labor-intensive micro-injection techniques compared to the current standard. Also, can long-term results be quantitated beyond clinical impression? Some clarification is needed regarding the newest hotspot for facial fat grafting, the medial cheek. The cheek fat compartment anatomy is confusing due both to the number as well as the superficial and deep locations of the multiple fat pads. Although the inverted mid-face V deformity of deflation is easy to recognize. It's not entirely clear in exactly what direction, how deep, and how much fat should be placed to improve it. Fat grafting during ritidectomy is an adjunct that adds more surgery time, at least 30 minutes, and sometimes more. It has to prove worthwhile long-term to justify the extra time and also compete successfully with numerous other procedures done concurrently so that overall surgical time does not reach prohibitive limits. This study verifies that more recent observations and theories regarding facial deflation are being accepted into the current practice of ASPS members. What's needed going forward is to establish best practices with regard to fat grafting technique as well as the optimal timing during ritidectomy. To define the best target areas for fat grafting with respect to efficacy while minimizing the potential for both medical and aesthetic untoward results. And finally, to establish guidelines for injection volumes and injection depths for the individual sites.